My name is Lila Allen, and my background is in art history. I've spent the last six years working in art museums in North Carolina and New York. In North Carolina, I led tours for children and adults, and it was led by visual analysis and inquiry. In New York, I worked on merchandise catalogs for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's those two experiences that inform my analysis today. If you're a reader of Vogue, you may have seen this image before. Annie Leibovitz shot this portrait of Kim Kardashian, Kanye West, and their daughter, Northwest, at their home in LA in 2014. What Leibovitz captures here is a 21st century Las Meninas moment. North is the Infanta, born into an empire of luxury and celebrity. Beyond the spectacle of the Kardashian West lifestyle, though, Leibovitz also documents a unique material atmosphere. There's the on-trend clear crib, which provides an unobstructed view of North. There's the delicate cherry blossom chandelier and the vaguely mid-century armchair. Remove Kim, Kanye, and North from the photo, and you still have a portrait of the West family by way of the designed environment. Rooms can be revelatory. They expose our tastes, fears, and anxieties. A child's room, then, is doubly fraught. There are reflections both of the parents' abilities and priorities, but also of their projected hopes for the child. My name is Lila Allen, and this year I've examined children's domestic environments of the last decade. And through, the, through these rooms, I've considered how contemporary attitudes towards childhood and parenting are embedded in representations of the child's room in American culture. Parental anxiety saturates news media and the bestsellers list today, typically paired with prescriptions for fixing them. If anything, I think this demonstrates that this is a social issue that we're dealing with. These anxieties are shaping the next generation. And I wanted to know how all of these ideologies quite literally take shape in the child's room. One of my case studies was the bedroom set from the show Blackish. The twin characters, Jack and Diane, share the room, and it also functions as their play space. If you're unfamiliar with the show, it presents the daily lives of the Johnsons, an affluent African-American family in Los Angeles. Through humor, Blackish makes poignant commentary on contemporary issues of class and race. I also looked at the nursery set from Modern Family, another popular sitcom. Lily, a child on the show, is the adopted daughter of a gay couple in Los Angeles. Last, I turned to an example of a real room here in New York City, the crisis nursery at the Foundling. The Foundling is one of New York's oldest and largest child welfare organizations. Its nursery descri describes itself as a safe haven where parents in an emergency can leave their children in residential care for up to three weeks. The nursery is not designed for a particular income, ethnicity, religion, or personality. It's designed for an every child. In the course of my research, two things became apparent. Children's rooms act as stabilizing environments, and the instabilities that they address often originate with the parent. Uh, today, I'd like to walk you through a few of the themes that emerged in these case studies. When Maxine Shepard, the production designer for Blackish, was hired, the Johnson family only existed on paper. Maxine's task was to create a set that convincingly depicted a home that they would live in. To Maxine, the room that the twins, Jack and Diane, share has a fictional backstory of having been designed by Rainbow, their mother. Even though the Johnson family could afford a professional decorator, for Rainbow, the room could be a creative outlet. And a quick note about Rainbow. She is the definition of type A. She's an anesthesiologist at a hospital, but also an overachieving mom and homemaker. She hosts high production dinner parties, like you see here, and also organizes family costumes and Christmas cards. She is the embodiment of zaniness, the aesthetic that cultural theorist Sian Nagai identifies as being marked by a particular style of incessant doing. Nagai identifies this aesthetic as being tied to labor, more specifically to, precar to the precariousness created by the capitalist organization of work. Indeed, the word zaniness itself derives from the character Zani, a servant figure in the Commedia dell'arte. Today, as an aesthetic and an element of comedy, zaniness is as much about labor frantic labor, as it is about playfulness. In the twins' room, this zaniness is echoed in the decor. The room is designed so that each twin has a half, both with their own colors and sets of patterns. In this shot alone, there are geometrics, florals, robots, and polka dots. Rainbow hasn't designed an ordinary child's room. 
She's created a space for these children to live side by side, but still have their own visual identity. The zany preoccupation with labor can also be found in the set from Modern Family. In the first episode of the show, characters Cameron and Mitchell, pictured here, adopt a baby from Vietnam and express fears over how this adoption will be perceived by others. The nursery that they prepare for her arrival is a soft but modern room around a customized mural. The painting presents Lily's fathers resting on clouds above her crib. In this position, they are literally always watching over her do their daughter. Designer Richard Berg told me that he based this painting on God and Adam from the Sistine Chapel. And to him, this was the ultimate image for representing what Lily meant to her parents. It's over the top. But this over the topness is part of its comedic appeal. I argue that these murals are also products of parental zaniness. As I mentioned before, zaniness is an aesthetic that is tied to work. Now, consider the labor that is implied by one of these murals, which are created on site and customized. They, create, or they require hours of work, not to mention years of honing one's craft as a painter. They can't be exchanged, return, or returned, or sold. They can only be covered up. They are originals without means of reproduction. A mural also adds a handcrafted touch to the wall of the crisis nursery at the Foundling, as you can see in this photo, which was used to promote a recent redesign of the facility. Unlike Lily's room in Modern Family, this mural image can't be customized for a specific child because of the broad audience served by the clinic. Stephanie Kearns, a VP at the Foundling that was involved with the renovation, told me that in visitation rooms, a mural like this was not a viable option because the rooms received too much wear and tear. In those spaces, the Foundling uses temporary decals obtained through a partnership as an alternative for a durable but personalized space. In this environment, where crisis is real, where a family's home life is truly in upheaval, design elements like these are gestures of normalcy and care. Another significant feature of the crisis nursery is its modular furniture. The chairs can be turned by children to sit at three different heights, and the soft block furniture is lightweight enough to be easily reconfigured and moved around. Bookshelves and toy storage are all at heights that can be reached by children. Contrast this with the set of Blackish, where they're stashed high above the twins' closets. At this height, they're out of children's reach and are accessible to them only with an adult's help. Shelves and a desk in Blackish are built in, and the furniture is heavy. It lacks the flexibility of design of the, of the Foundling Nursery. In Blackish, there is no intentionally designed, non improvised opportunity for Jack and Diane to act as the architects of their own space. By contrast, the accessibility and modularity of the Foundling Room combines physical activity with spatial manipulation, offering its residents the opportunity to control and manage their own surroundings during a period otherwise marked by crisis. Through the images we've just examined, it's possible to see how the design of children's rooms can embody certain anxieties. The zaniness of being a professional and a homemaker. The desire to demonstrate love through labor and the hopes to build a child's autonomy through at the foundling. These rooms stabilize by taming conflict and embedding values from the parent producer. But how is this relevant to you and me? Clearly, these are specific environments. If we turn to the marketplace or to familiar aspects of architecture, can we identify a through line of stabilizing design? These are questions I hope to answer in future projects. One potential application of this research could be an architecture and design exhibition. I would specifically like to extend my research um, examining how anxiety over children's safekeeping has constructed a material culture of surveillance. You could look at an object like this baby monitor, which dates to the 1930s, and say that the need to listen in on our children isn't new. But through advancements in technology, it is an anxiety that can now manifest itself in new forms. Today, monitors keep tabs on infants via recording, video recording that is uploaded to the web. However, it seems to be breeding new forms of anxiety. In the news, stories have emerged of hackers hijacking this footage. There's an opportunity to explore just how early our, our surveillance of children begins and how it manifests itself outside of the home through cameras, chipped identification cards, and even tech wearables. What are the potential outcomes of this technology and what are its ethical limitations? Does technology quell anxiety or just reshape it? We're currently raising the first generation whose entire lives will be documented in online photography in real time. 
In what ways does this reflect and potentially shape the relationship between future Americans and surveillance? I believe that these questions could prove fruitful with further exploration. Thank you.